All right, welcome everyone to lecture. A um, couple of announcements. Your project three had a optional contest. That optional contest is due tonight. So if you want to participate in that, it's similar to the project two contest. The main difference is that now you can store a file on the server in which you can store, let's say, things you learned while your agent was playing, retrieve that data, and then use that as you start playing again. Homework six is due on Monday. Um, so no break for the wary 188 students. Um, project four, Ghostbusters, is due next week Friday, 5 p.m., before spring break. The upside of this is that only one project after spring break left. Midterm one, um, we have graded your midterm one. Um, we still have to run some statistics and so forth. We still have to write the solutions. Once that's all in place, we'll publish back the grades to you. Um, whoever was in Dwinell got to deal with a fire alarm. If you have any concerns about the fire alarm, um, let us know, email us at the staff list or post on Piazza as some people have done. And we're very happy to see kind of what your concerns are and we'll see what to do about it um, depending on what the concerns are. All right, so AI in the news. This is an article about some Berkeley research that uh, the article came out just recently, uh, about a little over a week ago. New attack on HTTPS crypto might reveal if you're pregnant or have cancer. You might wonder what does that have to do with today's lecture? Well, it turns out the attack uses an HMM underneath. And later this lecture we'll see how that works and how even for encrypted data you might be able to figure out what people are doing um, using an HMM. In fact, much better so than without an HMM. All right, applications of HMMs are the topics of today's lecture. We've seen sometimes two lectures on HMMs. The first one was Markov models, which was building up to HMMs. Then last lecture was HMMs. Now we're going to look at a range of applications, but we'll start with a quick review and a couple of demos on topics we already covered. So demo Bonanza first, then we'll look at an extension. This is an extension of what we've seen so far. And then we'll look at two applications. Okay, so let's start with demos and review. So we looked at a Markov model, and the idea here was in a Markov model, you have a sequence of states. At each time, let's say time one, there's some state, at time two, there's some state, and so forth. The state at the next time is stochastically related to the state at the current time. And we have a model for that, and then we can do computation. We can compute what's the probability of it being rainy, then well sunny, at time t equal four, for example, right? Um, we saw the forward algorithm for this. We had also different representations. Um, then we extended this and we started looking at HMMs and the difference there was that now, rather than just having a state sequence, we now get evidence at each time. That evidence is typically a noisy measurement of the state but does not need to measure the state directly. For example, for the Ghostbusters examples, we weren't measuring an approximate location of the ghost directly, we were measuring a color and that color was somehow representative of how close the ghost might be, but not indicated, for example, of the direction from where you were measuring where the ghost might be. So here, over time, you have a temporal process, and in addition, you get to observe something about the state at each time. Our canonical example here was, is it raining or is it sunny? but we never get to see outside. We never get to see whether it's actually raining or sunny. All we get to see is whether somebody is carrying an umbrella or not carrying an umbrella. One thing you might say, well, if what we're interested in is the probability of it being rainy then while sunny, given I saw an umbrella, why do we start from this distribution over here, which is the probability of the evidence given the state? Whereas what we're really interested in is the probability of the state given the evidence. The reason we usually start with a thing that we don't want is because usually the way the system works is there's some causal chain, right? The fact that it's rainy or sunny will cause somebody to decide whether or not to bring along their umbrella. And that causal chain is easier to model. It's easier to come up with a 
conditional probability distribution for an effect given a cause than the other way around. And so the distributions we see are these effect given cause probability distribution, but usually then we only see the effect and now we want to get a distribution over what the cause might have been, and so that's where we have to turn things around, and that's why we get it usually in the wrong format, have to do some computation to get out the answer to the query we have. All right, let's do a couple of demos here. So let's start with, all right, so this was our initial scenario, right? This is um, a grid, somewhere in the grid there's a ghost, we don't know where, we have essentially a uniform distribution over where the ghost might be. If we measure at any given location, the color will be a noisy indication of how close you measure to a ghost. For example, I might be measuring here. Yellow means medium distance to the ghost, and so that means now it's likely for the ghost to be anywhere around here, because those are all medium distances. But it's not certain. It could just as well still be in this corner down here. This is all noisy. We see a distribution here. And we can kind of keep, keep measuring things, right? and narrow down where the ghost might be. Okay, at this point we have a pretty high probability. Then as time passes, that distribution can change. It depends on the model we have for how time passes. If from time t to t plus one the ghost stays put, then when I go from t to t plus one, nothing changes. In this case, the ghost doesn't stay put. The ghost seems to diffuse, decides to kind of move around a little bit. And so as time passes, we see this distribution kind of diffuse over time, and in this case, as time keeps passing, we seem to get kind of some diffuse distribution over here. If we had a particular model, we would know that system underneath knows the model, computes the corresponding distribution, shows it to us. One thing we know is that as we don't get any measurements over time, typically things get less and less certain. Let's look at an example we've looked at before where we on the slides, we assume that the ghost would move in a circle. So let's say we again do some measurements, maybe narrow down where the ghost might be. Okay, at this point, we, have a, we can think of this now as an initial distribution to a Markov model. Now we run inference in the Markov model, let one time step pass, see what the distribution is, and this distribution, the, the Markov model assumes the ghost goes around in a circle with some noise. So as time passes, you see indeed that motion is being executed, but the probability diffuses as there is some noise, and as we keep going along, distribution gets more and more diffuse over time, and we lose a lot of the information we initially had. We saw that often what happens is we get to a stationary distribution, right? Barring some really particular settings of the probability distribution, you get a stationary distribution independent of where you started, and at that point, well, often it'll be a very diffuse distribution, you don't have much information. So typically what happens as time passes is you lose information in some sense. That being said, it doesn't have to happen, right? If you had a dynamics model that was somewhat uncharacteristic maybe, but let's say your dynamics model was such that ghosts always move to the center. That's what they do. A ghost automatically from wherever they are moves to the center, then this case, without even doing any measurements, as we run inference in the Markov model, we see the distribution peaks around those two center squares. So what's happening here is the model says the probability of moving towards the center is very high compared to the probability of moving anywhere else, and as a consequence, we see all probability starts accumulating here. So while in general the transition model will diffuse your probability, it really depends on the specifics of the transition model, you have to look at the specifics to know whether it would diffuse your probability, that while maybe it's still concentrated somewhere. But the most typical scenario, it'll diffuse it, and then a measurement will help you narrow it down, again, where the ghost might be. All right, so that's our first set of demos here. Um, how does filtering happen in this hidden mark of models? We saw there are two basic steps, right? One step is elapsing time. When you elapse time, you start from a distribution for x t minus one, given all the evidence up to time t minus one. You then move the state through the transition model, which is shown over here. And then the probability for being in a particular state x t 
at the next time is a weighted sum based on where you were at, time, at, time xt minus, at time t minus one, and then the probability from that state xt minus one to land in xt. So that's the elapsed time component. That's the same as what happens in a Markov model. When we observe what happens is we have the distribution we had over here after we elapsed time. We now get evidence. If we multiply with the probability of the evidence, we now get the joint of the evidence and the state which is proportional to the conditional of the state given the evidence. And that's what this thing means over here. Remember, really, what we, need, what we should add here is a division over the probability of the evidence given E1 through T minus one. That's mathematically what would sit there if we had equality. But as always, whenever we're looking at a distribution on the left, and the distribution is in this case just over the X variable, then anything on the right that does not depend on the X variable can be gotten rid of, and as a consequence, the equality becomes this proportionate thing. You do the computation with what you have on the right, you get your table, it won't sum to one, but you knew that was coming. You now sum all the entries, that's your normalization constant, divide everything by your normalization constant, and that's the same as dividing by the thing you left out. All right, so effectively what's happening is whatever is compatible with the evidence will be weighted more highly relative to things that are not compatible with the evidence. Um, here is the rain-sun example, right? Initial distribution might be 50-50. Then we see evidence. We see a person is swinging an umbrella. You perform an update, which is the observation update over here depending on the specifics of the distribution, this happens to be how that comes out. Then there's a transition from one to two. That's an elapsed time update. That's the top update over here. And then you kind of keep repeating over time, see what happens. This algorithm is what we saw in action when we're looking at this last demo over here. Look at this one here. Again, this that goes going in a circle. Running an HMM comes down to saying, okay, initially maybe there's a measurement. After that measurement, time gets updated. Then there's a measurement again. Time gets updated. Measurement again. Time gets updated. And so forth. Keep going over time. And the result we see here is the belief at each time step after elapsing time after the measurement and so forth. All right, so that was HMMs. Then we said there's this one thing that is maybe a little unsatisfactory about HMMs, which is if our set of possible values the state can take on is really, really, really large, then every update involves going through each one of these entries in your table that the state, for values the state can take on. This could take a long time. Can we do something that's a little more focused on where we think it's likely that this, most of the probability mass will be, it'll be approximate, but it'll be more efficient maybe, and that's, that's the trade-off here. Higher efficiency, but then it'll be approximate. And the idea here was to put particles down. As a canonical example here for this map, we'd say, well, rather than specifying a full distribution over probability for every possible location on that map, just put down a couple of dots and say, maybe here, maybe here, maybe here, and together they are representative of the distribution over possible locations. All right, how did that algorithm work? Well, now you keep track of a set of particles shown over here. And initially maybe that's your set of particles visualized over here. What does that represent? It's an approximation of your distribution. And for example, if someone asks you, based on this set of particles, what's the probability of being in this square over here, you'd say, well, two particles there, total of 10 particles, so probability of being there is estimated as two over 10 based on this particular set of particles. All right, so then what needs to happen? The first thing that needs to happen is uh, time updates. So as time passes, rather than dealing with a distribution, you now deal with particles. And for each individual particle, you run a simulation, a stochastic simulation. For example, for the green particle, which was at 3.3, you look at your transition model, 
it tells you that there's a distribution over possible next states, given you're currently at 3.3. You sample from that distribution, and then that gives you a location for the next time for that particle. You repeat that 10 times, once for each particle. <coughs> All right, so that gives us a new set of particles, representative of the distribution at time t plus one. Then evidence comes in. We measured red over here. In the exact update, we would now update the probability for each of the possible states you have in your table. Now, we will, for each particle, weight it by how likely it was to see that evidence given that particular particle state. So here are the weights, and this weight over here corresponds to the probability of the evidence at this time being red given the state at this time is equal to 3, 2. And similarly for all the others, that's where the weights come from. They come directly from the conditional distribution of the evidence given the state. You look it up for the evidence you saw, and for each particle you know which state it is in. Then we said in principle we could be done here. This is now a representative distribution, a weighted distribution, right? If you now were asked to say, what's the probability of being over here? You'd say, well, um, that is a particle with weight 0.1. There's only one such particle there, so the probability is 0.1 divided by the sum of all the weights. If it were this one over here, what's the probability of being over there? That's the 3, 3 location. There is a particle here, and is there another one? Actually, that seems not to be 3, 3. There's only one 3, 3. That is the, see? Where do we have two? Maybe this list isn't right. Let's pick this location here. Was the probability of this location over here? We have three, two, three, two, three, two. Okay, the top one, this should be a three, three. I'll fix that on the spot here. So we have three particles with a three that are at three, two. Their combined weight is 2.7. You divide that by the total weight of all particles. That gives you your estimate based on this set of weighted particles of the probability of being in this particular location. All right, so after that we said we need to resample. Why did we resample? We said, well, um, there's a downside to resampling, right? Obviously we lost this particle over here in the resampling process, right? Because what we did is we looked at these weights, we renormalized, which gives us a distribution over particles, then sampled from that distribution over particles, gives us a new set of particles that are representative of where, what the state might be. We might lose particles. We lost this one over here. We're okay with that in that what we're doing here, we're doing something approximate, and we're saying it's okay to lose that one. It has a very low weight. It's not that representative of the current distribution. And what we gain by being willing to forfeit on some particles is that we get more particles over here where there's a high probability. You might say, well, what's really the difference having five particles or three particles? Well, the difference is if you now transition from time t plus one to time t plus two, and if there's noise in the dynamics model, which there is in these situations, then if you only have three particles, the way they will diffuse will not be as representative of the true distribution as if you had five particles that you could use to transition from there and get a diffuse distribution from there. So the more particles you have in a particular state, the better you can model how the distribution diffuses through the transition model when going to the next time. So that's why we want more than one particle in a given state. In fact, where there's high probability, we want many particles to be able to capture that distribution as accurately as possible. All right, so let's take a look at what happens in Ghostbusters with particle filtering. What's happening here is we have some particles, so not a huge amount of particles, and then the numbers you see there are the fraction of particles that landed in a particular square. We know the initial distribution was uniform, but when you sample from the uniform distribution, you don't get equally many samples in every bin. That's very unlikely to happen. It's just like when you do a coin flip, you flip a coin 
let's say six times, it's unlikely that you get exactly three heads, three tails. Same thing here. It's unlikely you match things exactly. Unless you have a gazillion samples, then it's likely you'll be v quite close. With a moderate number of samples, you will not be right on the mark. So this is our approximation of the initial distribution, which we knew was uniform. Now we have something else that's maybe close enough to uniform. If we're not happy with this, use more particles. It'll be more expensive to run your algorithm, so there's a trade-off there, but if you have the time, you have the cycles, willing to pay for the compute cycles, then you can put in more particles if it's worth it for you to get more accuracy. And as time passes, each of these particles gets simulated, makes a stochastic transition, lands in a new spot, or maybe stays in the same spot. And as a measurement happens, so let's say I measure over here, now these particles all get reweighted, then we resample from the reweighted particles, and this is what we get as a consequence. Then time passes again. Might measure again. Um, now, a lot of the particles after resampling are sitting right over here. Um, it does mean we lose accuracy out in the corners, where maybe we don't know anymore. Was it 0.001 probability or 0.00001? That accuracy we're losing at this point, but we're okay with that because we are assuming here that Doing it exact is too expensive. We're gonna do something approximate instead, and this is something we're happy with. Then time passes again. Particles all move. Again, maybe the clever thing would be to measure right around here. Um, time passes again. We measure here. Time passes again. Measure here, and so forth. You see that with a moderate number of particles in this case, we can actually keep track of this reasonably well. Here we have a little bit of diffusion, and we're hoping that soon it'll concentrate again on the particular uh, location the ghost might be at. Of course, at this point, you look at all these numbers, right? It's only approximate, let's maybe here, let's track down again a little more. It's escaping us, there we go. We can do multiple measurements. Help us a little bit. We can track the ghost reasonably well, maybe not as well as we could exactly. Another thing to keep in mind is that you, you don't know, right, at this point, even though you have a distribution here, you don't know if really the probability is that much. It's probably not, it's just an estimate. So keep that in mind. As a function of the number of particles, it'll get more and more accurate. So let's switch to a much larger number of particles. Um, what happens when we have, for all practical purposes, infinitely many particles? then it looks like this. Essentially, everything is now equal. Not exactly, because we don't have infinitely many particles, but it's, it's very large. Looks a lot like exact inference now. We measure, it'll behave a lot like exact inference. As time passes, we'll be able to kind of keep track of things everywhere reasonably accurately, because we have so many particles. Even when we resample, even though we might get less particles in uncertain places, we still retain some particles so we can keep track of what's going on in those places. Maybe let's do a couple of measurements here um, to concentrate the probability mass a little bit. And then let time pass. Question there? All right, so with many particles, it's hard to distinguish between what happened with exact inference versus many particles. Um, the typical reason you'd want to use particle filtering, keep in mind, is when your state space is very large compared to the number of states where there is a reasonable probability mass. That's the question you need to ask yourself. How large is the state space relative to the number of states that have a reasonable probability? If state space is much larger, then particles will be an efficient way to go. If the state space is much smaller, or not smaller, but is equal to the number of states that have a reasonable probability mass, then you might not gain a whole lot from a particle filter. Okay, let's look at one more particle filtering example here. And just see what happens if we run with one particle. So we just run with one particle. What that allows us to do is to see what happens to a single particle in, in this process here. Initially, this particle sitting over there. It's not a good estimate of the real distribution, but that's what you get with one particle. Can't do much better than picking a state. Um, uh, we measure, not much is going to happen, right? Because we have our one particle. Its weight might go up or down, but then it gets resampled. 
it's gonna be always that particle, there's no change in what can be resampled. You're stuck with that one particle, time passes, it moves somewhere else, you can measure, again, measurement does nothing, um, time passes, we measure again somewhere, it, likely the ghost is around here based on this measurement, right, somewhere here, not out there, we only have one particle. Okay, now the particle is a very low weight, you do your resampling, you only have one particle to sample from, so all probability mass goes to that one particle, and you're still there. Time passes again, measurement, and so forth. So this is the process, you can see what happens if you have too few particles, you can see how you're in some sense not able to adapt to the measurements. The extreme case is one particle, the measurements do nothing for you. Whether you measure or not, that particle's always gonna be in the same place. Like, when I do time plus one and so forth, the same thing's gonna play out whether I measure or not. Only thing that's going to be different is that the weight of the particle will temporarily have gone down, and then will have been reset to one after resampling. All right, that's an extreme case that you wanna stay away from, but keep this in mind, if you have a small number of particles, the same thing could happen, right? You just have a small number of particles, think your robot is in room one, don't put any particles in room two. All your measurements are compatible with room two, well, a particle filter will not start putting any mass there if you don't have any particles there. They stay where they were, and it'll still all these particles will have then equal weight again, and they'll say nothing to you about, hey, we're in the wrong place. No, they just get reweighted, resampled, and they're all bad. So one important thing is to have good coverage such that you cover parts of the space where it's likely things are going to be. All right, let's look at a kind of real world application. Robot localization, what's the problem here? You know the map, you know what the environment is like, um, you have a sensor model, let's say this is a sonar, what would that mean? That you know if you're in a certain location on the map and you beam out your sonar sensors um, beams, what happens is you send out ultrasound in a certain direction, it comes back because it bounces off something there, you measure the time it took to come back, then you say, well, speed of sound is about this fast, so as a consequence I know roughly how far away the first obstacle is in that direction. Then you characterize the noise of your sensor. You go in, you put your, put your ultrasound in front of a wall, and you say, well, if I'm one meter away, what do I measure? And you'll see there's some variability. You put it a little further away. You see what the variability is and so forth, and that way you build your sensory model that tells you as a function of distance, what's the distribution over distances you're likely to measure. Ultrasound will be very noisy, actually. If you had a laser, it'll be probably about two, three centimeter accurate, so it'll work a lot better. Um, a little maybe more expensive, but more accurate. But there could be other noise. So you could say, well, my laser is really good, but what if your robot is going around trying to localize itself in a map, but then somebody moved the chair around, right? And now that chair is reflecting the beam. Well, then the robot will be confused. So when you build your sensory model, you need to account for those things. You'll say, well, there's some probability maybe I get any kind of measurement back, which corresponds to somebody having moved furniture around, such that I don't totally think that probability is zero for something just because somebody had moved something around. So your sensory model is something you spend a lot of time thinking about, building it, then once you have it, you run an HMM to localize your robot. So let's take a look at this one here. So what's happening here? Initially we have 40,000 particles. It's a lot of particles, but it's a continuous space. This is in a building, your robot could be somewhere in this building. Um, principally there's infinitely many poses you should put a probability on. So 40,000 particles is pretty good compared to infinitely many. And then the robot starts moving. So the visualization here is the red corresponds to a particle. If there's many particles close together, you'll just see a clump of red. The green here is just a current estimate of where the robot might be. Honestly, initially, it could be kind of anywhere. It's just something that's put down. You'll see sometime, at some point, it might jump around when it changes its mind about where the robot might be most likely. This is when you try to get one number out. What's your best number? All right, you can average things. You can just look which region has the most particles and then average those particles. A few things you can do here, but overall, honestly, a most likely location is not that useful if really the distribution is uniform. So don't worry about it too much when your distribution is this uniform. Okay, then the robot moves. Um, 
sends out its beams, those are the blue rays, then it measures the compatibility, right? How, how likely was it, get, was it to get those lengths of beams for, this, for each particle, so for each of these particles, so even though it's shown here, it's actually for each of these 40,000 particles, it's checking if I were here facing a particular direction and I got these seven readings, how likely is it to get those? That probability is the weight that particle gets. That happens for all 40,000 particles. Then they get, the weights get renormalized. You resample from those particles, and then you'll see that there will be more particles in some places than others, depending on how compatible the locations are with these measurements. So initially, not much is found out because it's a noisy sensor, but you see now the kind of very crowded space is becoming less and less likely because the measurements it's been seeing are very long measurements. It's as if you're going down a hallway, you, see, you have this long measurement in one direction that keeps repeating. Um, so at this point, it's starting to narrow it down to locations that are in hallways. It's a couple of particles still in other places because it's not completely zero probability, but it's narrowing it down more and more. Another thing you see here is that you can adapt the number of particles. When you have to cover the entire space, sure, you need a lot of particles. Now they're all clustered together. If you end up with all particles pretty much in the same place or more concentrated, you can reduce how many you sample. When you resample, instead of resampling 40,000 times, maybe you resample 20,093 times in this case. So over time, in this case, the robot has been moving in the same direction repeatedly, repeatedly, and you see at some point it sees, oh, well, I must have been over here because otherwise these measurements were not compatible and now it's localized itself pretty well. It can have a very small number of particles to keep track of where it's at moving in this uh, building here at the University of Washington. So the distribution we're computing is the distribution that you have in the HMM, the probability distribution for the current state, which is location, given all evidence seen so far. It's an approximation because it's computed based on particles, but that's what it's intending to compute. Are you asking why they have only so few particles at the end, or how come they found out where the robot is? At the point where everything is narrowed down to just a few, to all particles being close together, you have a distribution that puts a lot of mass in around one particular location, and so that distribution tells you with high probability the robot is there. Um, you have to be careful though. If you did not use enough particles, it's always possible that your particles just clustered in one location, but it's not the correct location. So to be sure that you land in the correct location, you need to have had enough particles, which is a little hard to know ahead of time. Um, but that's essential, because if somehow you didn't cover some part of the space and that's where the robot was, then the way particle filters work, they never move particles around. They only reweight them. So any hypothesis that you didn't have available, you're just not going to recover. And so that's where they tend to fail. If you don't have enough hypotheses to cover the space and then it was somewhere that you didn't cover, now you have bad luck. Um, but in general, if you did have enough particles, yes. Once it clusters, you know where the robot is. Here. Okay, because the robot is being controlled. So this robot is being controlled, is being moved around, and the transition model knows that it's being moved around, let's say, one foot forward. It knows I'm being moved one foot forward. It doesn't know exactly what that means because it might slip a little bit, so it might have a transition model that has a distribution that puts some mass spread around one foot forward, um, and maybe a little bit of the angle deviation, but that's what's happening. It, it knows it's being moved and has a model for that motion, and then it measures and that allows it to more accurately realize how much it moved. Turns out you can go beyond this. So 
What I mean with going beyond this is that you can not just localize the robot, you can also build a map at the same time. The way this works is that now, in your state, you don't just have the location of the robot, you have the location of the robot and the map. There are many, many maps, right? There's many, many possible maps of a place you haven't seen. So a particle now has both location and map. Then as the robot moves, it'll get a measurement, it'll see how compatible is this measurement with the map and with my location in that map. And then based on that, the particle will be reweighted. Then you'll resample, and this will keep repeating. Um, the technicality is to get this to work, you need to play some extra tricks, but that's the overall picture of what's going on, is that you somehow have a both map and robot location that you're keeping track of in your HMM. So let's take a look at how this plays out. We have SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And so what's happening here, start from the beginning. We have the robot in red. Um, the particles will be shown in green. So at this point, there's very little uncertainty. The robot in red is covering all the particles. Now they're kind of starting to pop out from underneath of the robot because there's more and more hypotheses. The map that's most consistent with all these particles is the one uh, being shown. And so the uncertainty grows and grows as you go along because um, if you think about what's going on here is that you have nothing to localize against. You only have to localize against the map that you're building yourself. As you're building your map, you don't know if this building is set up to have uh, perfect 90 degree corners or is it more set up like a spiral and you might be spiraling in as you go around this loop, right? So there's uncertainty here and at this point the robot doesn't know exactly where it's at relative to where it started, which means it cannot perfectly build the map. At some point when it comes back around, you'll see all the particles collapse. Let's wait for that to happen. So it's coming back around, boom. So right there, it had particles in many places. And then a little further along, what's happening is this measurement is showing that indeed you went around the, around the loop and you're back where you started out from. The one particle that perfectly kept track of the motion of the robot, or almost perfectly, will have measurements that are very, very compatible with where it thinks it is. Because it, it sees, oh, I see all the structure I saw in the beginning, this measurement is compatible with that, and that particle will get essentially all the weight. All the other particles, they're offset, and the measurement will not match up very well at all with what they have stored in their particle. They'll not be resampled because their weight is very low, and everything collapses, and you get this kind of map rectification here automatically happening as you run inference in your HMM. All right, so that's localization and mapping at the same time. Let's take a look at a quick review of what we saw last time at the very end, uh, dynamic base nets. So what's the idea here? We'll look at base nets in more detail later, but dynamics base nets are a special form of hidden Markov model, where now at each time, there can be more than one variable that's in the state and more than one variable that's in the evidence. So you could have two ghosts, each of them has their own state variable, their location, and each of them has their own evidence variable something noisy about where they might be. Then as time passes, somehow the way they transition to the next time where they might be is related. Ghost B might decide where to go based on where ghost A is. It might say, well, we kind of want to spread out because we don't want to cover the same part of the space. Same for ghost A. It might look at where ghost B is and based on that decide where to go. That's shown by these arrows over here, saying that the location of ghost A at time two depends on the location of Ghost A at time one, of course, because that's itself, and then also in the location of ghost B at time one. For ghost B at time two, we see a dependence on where it was at the previous time, and then we see an interdependence here, which is essentially encoding, oh, ghost A got to make its move first, and then ghost B decided after that, based on where ghost A was and where it was at the previous time, where it would move to for the next time, maybe with some noise. And then there is a new measurement. So again, the arrows indicate the causal um, process that's happening here, but likely noisy, okay? So it's a lot like an HMM. In fact, you can simplify this to an HMM, but it would not be as efficient computationally underneath, right? You could think of this whole thing combined as a bigger state, this whole thing as a bigger state, this whole thing as a bigger evidence variable, this whole thing as a bigger evidence variable, and so forth. Then it would be an HMM again, 
but you would be ignoring the structure that's underneath. And exploiting the structure underneath allows you to be computationally more efficient. All right, so they're just a generalization of HMMs where you exploit some structure underneath. Um, you can again run particle filters in these, right? So you initialize, and this is why I want to get back to this. When you run particle filtering in these dynamic base nets, you want to have a particle represent the entire state. So you don't have a particle per ghost. You have a particle for the entire state. If there's two ghosts, one particle encodes the location of both ghosts. In this case, maybe initial particle that you're working with has these two locations. This is one particle right here. Then you sample a successor, which generates where both ghosts might be at the next time. And then when you observe, you incorporate both evidence, both evidences, multiply the probability of the first evidence given the state and probability of the second evidence given the state. That together, multiplied together, makes for the weight of that particle. And then when you resample particles, same process, you just kind of resample based on their weights and then continue repeating this. Why is it important that your particles contain both ghosts at once, rather than running two, you can imagine running two separate particle filters, right? One for ghost A, one for ghost B. If you were to do that, then you cannot model the dependencies. You will not, your distribution will not represent the joint between the two ghosts. It will be okay for representing where ghost A is with some probability, ghost B with some probability, but then it can't capture how they interact. You lose that interaction. Okay, let's take a look at your project four. Who has started project four? Very few people. Project four is super cool. You should look at it soon. It's also maybe the most time consuming one. Um, so, let's take a look here at your project four. This is the game you get to play or get the program an agent for. Pac-Man is in a maze. The ghosts are there, can't see them. Four ghosts are in this maze, but you don't know where they are. Your job as Pac-Man is to find the ghosts, and when you run into one, you're actually winning this time when you run into a ghost, and you put them in their little ghost jail spot at the bottom left. So here, this is me playing, just kind of running around, hoping to run into a ghost. I run into the blue ghost. That gives me some points. And the, the ghosts stay in their jail once you get them. Um, let's see if we can find another one. We found the orange one, found another blue one. One left somewhere. All right, just running blindly is not a very good strategy. So what you're going to do is implement inference, the forward algorithm, inside an HMM that models this scenario over here. Once you run the forward algorithm, you keep track of a distribution of where the ghost might be. You get observations, you see where they might be. So this is our agent in action. It's getting measurements. Based on that, it's keeping a distribution of where the ghost might be. Then wherever that probability mass is, it goes and tries to catch the ghost. Not too lucky yet. There, got the orange one. So you'll be implementing both a way to keep track of the ghosts and a way to go hunt down where they are based on that distribution and put them all in jail. There we go. Your project four. Okay, one technique I want to cover today, new technique, that actually in practice can be quite important is a different way of doing inference. So far, what we've looked at is something that computes the distribution over possible states at the current time, given all the evidence we've seen so far. Sometimes what you want to do is you see all the evidence, and then based on all the evidence you've seen, you want to reconstruct the most likely sequence of events that explains that whole sequence of evidence. This is different. So you're not trying to recover a full distribution over everything. Just trying to say, what is the most likely sequence of states given the evidence I have observed? That's the most likely explanation query, or MLE. So we're given an HMM still. We get 
We have state variables, observations. We have an initial state distribution, a transition model, an emission model. And then the query is, what's the most likely explanation of the evidence we have observed? So again, shading means observation. So we've seen evidence variables, E1, 3, 4, and so forth. And we're trying to find what, what the most likely sequence of X variables is here. The algorithm we'll look at is called the Viterbi algorithm. It's a lot like the algorithm we've already seen, so we'll look at both of them in parallel. So, but keep in mind, it computes an answer to a somewhat different query than what we've seen so far. So let's visualize this. So what's going on here? This is a state trellis. What this is is, this is time one here. Could be sunny or rainy. Time two could be sunny or rainy and so forth. From time one, where you transition from time one to time two, there's some probability of going to sun, some probability of going to rain. We can associate probabilities with these edges. So for example, this edge over here will have probability of rain given sun on it multiplied with the evidence. That, let's say we have evidence here, maybe E1, E2, and so forth. Then multiply with the probability of E2 given rain. That's the probability we associate with that edge. So we're saying making that transition from sun at time one to rain at time two, the probability we associate with that is the probability of going from sun to rain times the probability of seeing the evidence we saw at time two, given that we assumed rain at time two. Now, you can do this for all of these edges. You can associate that probability of the transition and the evidence with each edge, whatever it is corresponding to each edge. And then you can start looking at paths in this graph. You can say, here's a path. Every path that runs left to right, but it can go up and down along the way, encodes a sequence of states. What I just crossed followed is the path sun, 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 sun. I could also look at the path rain, sun, rain, sun, and so forth. There are many, many paths. If we multiply the weights we put on each of these edges together for a given path, that gives us the probability of that particular state sequence jointly with the evidence. So in that, tracing paths out, computing the product of the edge weights gives the probability of that state sequence and the evidence. We're interested in the probability of a state sequence given the evidence, of course, but we know that's just a renormalization. The evidence is fixed for all paths, so that's just shared by everybody. We don't need to worry about that. So what we can do is we can trace out all paths in this graph that will run left to right, going always from t to t plus one, compare their weights, so the multiplication of probabilities that we get for each path, rank them, whichever one gives the highest probability, that's the most likely explanation of the sequence of evidence we observed. That's our answer. Now there are many paths. Many paths here for a sequence of length n, there are two to the n paths, because we have two choices at each point. So we don't want to do this naive enumeration of all paths to then see which one had the highest weight. We want to do something a little more efficient, and it will be very similar to the forward algorithm. But in principle, the naive approach would find you the correct solution, just expensive. Okay, what was the forward algorithm? We had a recursive computation. We kept track of the probability of xt jointly with all the evidence so far, we could compute that from the same quantity at the previous time as follows. We said, if we had this quantity at the previous time, probability of xt minus one given the evidence of time up to time t minus one, we multiplied with the probability of xt given xt minus one, that's a temporal transition. Of course, it's a sum out over xt minus one, and then we multiply with the probability of the evidence et given xt. That was the forward algorithm. We can now write down a very similar recursion that works with the max. We're not interested in the sum here. We want this to be a max. What's the intuition here? In the forward algorithm, we were interested in distribution here for sun and rain, and then we're here, let's say a particular state value is sun. What's the probability of having sun here? Well, it's the probability of having sun here multiplied with the probability of going there, multiplied with the probability of the evidence, plus the probability of having rain here, multiplied with the probability of transitioning, multiplied with the probability of the evidence. So you sum together the contribution from this and this state each weighted by its transition probability and the evidence. That's what's happening. When we want to find the most likely explanation, you say, well, what's the most likely sequence of states? And you say, well, how likely, you know, if I want to find the most likely sequence of states, and let's say I assume it's going to include sun, then if I'm going to complete that based on what's happening before by having sun over here, then I know the way to complete it is by having 
whatever is the most likely sequence of three states over here that ends in sun. And also what I have to look at is the most likely sequence of three states that ends in rain. Those are the two sequences I care about. And then I compare most likely sequence to end in sun, transitioning to sun, probability of the evidence given sun, that's one thing. We compare that with most likely sequence that ends in rain, and then add on the transition into sun. Whichever one of those two is the most likely, we retain, and now we know what the most likely way is to reach sun in these four transitions. So the recursion looks as follows. The maximum probability, joint probability between states at all times and evidence at all times can recursively be looked at as follows, right? We single out, so what's happening here is we write out the same factorization we had over here. But the difference now is that we have a max instead of a sum. That's the only difference. And we keep track of the max rather than the sum. This is a fast explanation. Um, I strongly encourage you to go through this on your own time and make sure that you're happy with how this plays out. Kind of go through the math, see if indeed this makes sense and that you are able to rederive this. All right, let's take a short break here and then let's look at um, the crypto application and the speech application of HMMs. All right, let's get restarted. Any questions about the first half of lecture? Okay, let's take a look at this article then. AI in the news here, uh, a new attack on HTTPS crypto by a Berkeley PhD student and uh, his advisor. So Brad Miller, who was a, actually a GSI for 188 last spring, uh, which his advisor looked at this. What's going on here? So the setting is as follows. Um, we, want to, we want to spy on somebody, that's the idea, right? They think they're browsing anonymously, that nobody knows what they're doing, but we're gonna anyway find out what they're doing, that's the idea. Um, so we want to spy on them, they use HTTPS. We, we cannot crack the content of the packets they're going back and forth, that's uh, encoded in some way that we don't know how to crack, let's say. Um, but what we do get the measure is we get to measure the IP address of the websites they visit, and we'll consider just one browsing session, let's say. Let's say somebody goes to a health website, could be an application, right? Somebody goes to a health website, you know the health website because you know that IP address matches to a particular health website. And then from then onwards you see that IP address comes back and back and back and you see packets coming to the user. And the size of those packets is something you get to observe. You don't know what's inside them, but you know the size of the packets. The goal is then to infer the browsing sequence of that user on that website. Why could this be interesting? I mean, it's malicious of course, but why, why would somebody have this malicious interest to do that? Um, maybe you're an employer, you really shouldn't be doing this, but you're trying to keep tabs on your employees and see what they're browsing while they should be working. You want some idea what's going on. Um, maybe you want more detail. Maybe you're, you think um, you're worried about, you want to know if somebody has some disease, one of your employees, um, and you might be able to track them on the health website, which if you can track where they go on that website, you might know what diseases they're interested in, what they're reading about, and so forth. Clearly a privacy violation, but I mean, in some sense, what this research is about that they did is to sh they wanted to show that it's not as safe as you think it is. We might need to improve the system such that people can browse more anonymously than they can because here's a way to show it's not all that anonymous, what you have right now. So it could be financial stuff, you know, you could maybe find out things about your employees, maybe they're, you know, managing huge amounts of money somewhere else, who knows, and uh, reading about investments, and you wonder, well, I only pay them very little, why is this going on? Um, legal things, maybe they're, they're browsing a website about legal affairs, and how about suing their employer? Now you can find out that that's what they're doing. Things like that. So you, you can model this as an HMM. The idea here is that you build a transition model, and uh, Brad and collaborators, what they use is a very simple transition model. If you're on a given page, every link is equally likely to be followed from that page. Maybe with some negligible probability on other uh, pages. Then you need to build an observation model. Like, this is typically where you spend time. How do you build an observation model for this? Well, what you do is you go visit those websites ahead of time. 
also encrypted with HTTPS, you then see what the packet sizes are that you get back when you follow certain links. There is, it's not deterministic. There is variability there. Why? Well, you might have some caching on your machine. Some images that you already got from that web page might not be reloaded, so you need to account for that kind of effect. Um, there might be dynamically generated content that's not always exactly the same length. Um, there could be user-specific content, such as cookies that are being sent out and so forth. So what you end up doing is you go through each of these URLs, you ping them many, many times with different, his different browsing histories, and then you see, statistically speaking, what, is, what tends to happen, build a distribution over packet sizes. That's your emission model. Now, if somebody's browsing somewhere, you can use this HMM, and you can run inference over time to see what is the distribution over possible URLs within that IP address that they are currently visiting. So that's what they did. Here are the results they got. So on the left axis, what you see is accuracy. The vertical axis measures accuracy. How accurately do they predict what page you are on? Um, and a lot of these sites would have a couple hundred pages that the user could be on. So this is very good accuracy, right? Out of a few hundred pages, they're narrowing it down, um, getting it right. Quite frequently, the mo rightmost bar of each of these four bars is the results they got in this recent paper, which is higher accuracy than any of the previous papers by quite a bit. Um, by introducing this hidden Markov model. Um, so this works quite well. You can also see um, over time, as you are browsing, it gets more accurate, right? Because you get more and more evidence over time. And so things narrow down. It's like when you get more and more measurements of the ghost location, they're noisy, but over time you narrow it down. In this case, it saturates around 89% accuracy that they can recover where you're at. Okay, so that's one application. Um, the reason I really like this one is because it's quite different from any of the other applications we cover in 188. So it's nothing to do with the typical AI application scene. Yes? I agree with you, and I'm going to refer you to their paper to find out more exactly what the details are. We're just giving kind of a high-level view here. And it's true, for some of these websites, it makes, it's pretty easy to infer what might be going on. Mayo Clinic, it's an informational website. You kind of just browse through it. YouTube, I'm not 100% sure how they narrowed it down so well because it has so many pages. Um, it might be, if, if somehow it always recommends the same set of videos, there are only so many recommended videos, it might be that they looked at that kind of pattern among the recommended videos, can you recover which one they follow? But then that seems quite personalized, so tricky to do. All right, then let's look at another application, speech recognition. Who has used speech recognition? Maybe kind of dictation or talking to Siri or something else. Some people, who has had good success with speech recognition? Okay, you've had good success. In which context? <laughs> to dictate Chinese onto your phone. All right. Any other success stories of speech recognition? You, you raise your hand. Asking things, OK? So quick notes, asking things. Which application would you ask things? So Dragon Diction for taking notes. Anything else people have used, aside from Chinese dictation and Dragon Diction? Anybody success with Siri, success with anything else here? The Google Voice here, mixed success. Um, there were a lot of hands initially, people having used it, so it seemed like most of the use has not been super successful. Um, speech recognition actually can work reasonably well these days. It depends a lot on how many computational cycles people are willing to put behind it to kind of get you the answer, right? Because it costs money to run computation, and so depending on the, how much they're willing to spend on computation, you might get a better or worse answer. Um, an application I use medium frequently is uh, if somebody calls me at my Google Voice number, Google Voice will transcribe it as a email, which is nice because then I can just check in my email what they left as a voicemail rather than 
having to go listen to a voicemail, which is always kind of annoying and slow. Um, so it's out there. It depends a lot, I would say, on how much computation is put behind it, how well it works, and how much data has been used to train the HMM that's behind it. That will also determine how well this all works. Of course, the conditions matter, too. If you speak in a noisy environment, you're in a, at a concert and you talk to Siri, it might not understand you nearly as well as when you're in a quiet room or in a recording studio where you're the only person saying something. So how does it work? Let's first take a look at what speech is, right? What is speech? Something speech is this thing that comes in. It's a pressure wave in the air. And to digitize it, you have that pressure wave go into a microphone, which effectively is a membrane that will oscillate the way the air oscillates. That membrane is attached to a magnet or to a coil, either way. Um, let's say it's attached to a coil, then that coil will move relative to a magnet and the relative motion of magnet and coil will result in an induction current in the coil, which then in turn corresponds to the oscillation that was in the air. So that's your speech signal being digitized. What does it look like? Here's an example of an acoustic waveform. So, um, all right. Any guesses what's being said here? Hello world is an option. Two words, is, uh, and, okay. So this is what speech recognition gets to deal with, right? But in addition to getting to deal with this, it gets a lot of annotated data where it's already seen before what waveform corresponds to what sound, which you haven't seen yet. You haven't been trained. You're just trying to perform recognition here without having had a lot of training data. So this happens to say speech lab. So sometimes two words, so that's good. Um, What's going on inside here? So let's look at this in a little more detail. So the S sitting over here, that's just not a whole lot of stuff happening, some kind of noise really that's happening. Then P shows up as nothing, which is quite interesting, right? Nothing's happening there, there's no signal. Really, the P only shows up when you start saying the E is when it kind of shows up in this signature over there. If it had been not P, but maybe T or yet something else, then that initial part of the E would have been different. But as long as you're just sitting there ready to pronounce your P, as long as there's no next letter, there's nothing next coming, you haven't said anything yet, your lips are just closed, and that's it. So the P happens to mostly sing signal itself over there. Then there's the E, which is a lot like this. Then lab, that goes on here, a vowel again. So really what you see is that the vowels have most of the action, and then the hissing sounds have a lot of action too. And then other consonants, not all that much going on. All right, now let's take a look at how the ear works, because it might motivate us in terms of how we want to deal with this. So to look at the ear, it's not exactly a microphone, but it's quite similar. There's this membrane here. So things come in here, hit your membrane. That membrane will vibrate. Then some fluids will vibrate accordingly. Those fluids kind of transmit into this kind of weird looking shape here, snail looking shape. That shape is effectively a filter. What that is doing, you can look at how much activity there is anywhere along that shape as you go through this spiral. And you'll see that each part of that spiral will have more energy depending on whether that particular frequency is present. So some frequencies will manifest themselves here, some here, some here, some here, and so forth. And so there'll be some kind of maybe low frequencies in the beginning, high frequencies at the end, or the other way around. Um, it's fixed, but I don't know which order it is. So, and then there are neurons sitting there that will see how much activity there is in each part of this spiral, and then based on that, they effectively get out what is a Fourier transform. It tells you the presence of frequencies in the input signal. We can do Fourier transforms in a digital computer. We don't need to build the spiral contraption that's in our ear. And here's what you get. You do a Fourier transform on speech lab. So what we see here is the s. It's essentially white noise, and all frequencies are present to some extent. Not exactly the same, but pretty close. Then the ch is quite similar, maybe shifted a little bit down, but that's it. Um, 
Then for vowels, like the E, we have, this is time here, and vertical is frequency. So we have more focused presence in certain frequencies for the E, same for the A uh, in lab. We have certain frequencies that are present, and this is typical for vowels. Vowels will have certain frequencies that are present, and then the hissing sounds will be looking mostly like noise, but maybe shifted, and then constants will yet be something else, often kind of present in the beginning stretch over here for the next vowel. So if you want to build an HMM for speech, this is the space you're going to be working in in practice. You're going to first transform this into uh, a frequency description of your signal. Take small slices, let's say five millisecond slices, 10 millisecond slices, look at the frequencies present, and then your emissions will be the presence of certain frequencies. And they will have some, each frequency will have some probability depending on the sound that you're pronouncing at that particular time. All right, so here's, if you zo zoom in a little more, what you see is indeed you see a regular pattern. Whenever you see a periodic pattern, you know that there is a small number of frequencies present, right? That's what something with a small number of frequencies looks like, regular pattern, and indeed, if you look at the Fourier transform, you have a peak over here, a peak over here, and a peak over here. The way vowels will be recognized effectively, not explicitly, but the way it'll underneath turn out to work is that you essentially look at this envelope and have a description of this envelope of what frequencies are present with how much strength that will characterize that envelope and that will give you evidence about which vowel is being pronounced. Okay, why do these peaks show up? What happens? You pump air through your lungs, all right, so somehow at the bottom here, you have some muscle, pumps things up, the air comes out, it goes over your vocal cords, which then will introduce an oscillation. Turns out the way these oscillations work, the way these physical systems work is that you have some fundamental frequency that gets generated, and then all integer multiples of that fundamental frequency get generated too. So you have a whole set of frequencies being generated. Then what happens is, depending on what you're trying to pronounce, your lips and tongue will be in a, and your entire mouth will be in a different shape. The shaping of your mouth, everything here determines how this thing, which you start from, then becomes something like this. So it's, your mouth is acting like a filter. Some of that filtering is specific to what you're trying to pronounce, right? Maybe a particular vowel, a particular consonant, and so forth. Some of that filtering is specific to the specifics of your mouth, and so that's why you can distinguish between different people saying something. You can't just recognize what they're saying. You might also be able to recognize who is speaking because their mouth will be slightly differently shaped. Also, the fundamental frequency they generate, they generate might be different. That will depend on the length of their pipe underneath. All right, and then there's an output sequence that you get to observe, and that's what we work with. Um, so. To simplify this, kind of a basic physics model is that your head, lungs, and so forth, essentially it acts like a tube. You have a tube, your vocal cords are sitting at the bottom, this oscillation at the bottom of the tube, that's the closed end over here. That oscillation makes air oscillate, you get a wave propagating, and then depending on the length, that will determine your fundamental frequency. So somebody who's taller, not per se, but at least have a longer, uh, throat, so to say, and longer mouth, they will have a lower fundamental frequency. The shorter you are, the more likely fundamental frequency will be a higher pitch. And then the shaping here affects what exact sound you're making. All right, so now we know how that works. Um, we can do a little demo. So we now know how it works. Essentially, if you want to generate a vowel, you generate these this fundamental frequency, multiples of that, for a computer will generate a fundamental frequency and two multiples. Um, then this here is our way of shaping the mouth. So I have two degrees of freedom here, kind of referring to whether the tongue is touching more up front, more in the back, um, or is lower. And so we have <laughs> Corresponding to the envelope we pick here, um, 
We can change the overall frequency, right? If you change the bass frequency, you can get higher pitch. So forth, let's go back to a more um, comfortable pitch. All right, so why does this sound robotic? The reason it sounds robotic is because when we look at these sounds, you just see the frequency, just two or three frequencies are present, and they're just shaped in amplitude, and that gives you the different sounds. Um, if a person speaks, as you saw in the data, it's, there is uh, a much denser population of the frequency spectrum than just these two or three um, main frequencies that we have for a computer here. Um, you can speak this way, so let's, let's try to make the one sentence that I'm aware of, we can make with this system here. I, I, O, I, O, A, A, O, A, OK, so at this point, <laughs> You can build computer speak for one sentence and any vowels that you might want to generate using the system we just described. You're going to have to do a little more effort to build a system that also has consonants in it. But at least you get the gist of some part of the, how it works. All right. So now we can take a look at what if one person who is capable of s singing, in this case, definitely not me, um, pronounces the same sound but at different um, pitches. So it starts with F sharp 2, A2, C3, and so forth. And see what happens if when we look at the frequency spectrum. So what's happening is that the same sound is pronounced, and correspondingly, the shape is actually quite similar across these different uh, executions here. But what's changing is that we see a shift the lowest frequency that's present, which is the, frequency, the lowest frequency you generate, and you get all the um, integer multiples of that, of course, shifts up. And over here, it shifted up quite a bit. And that fundamental frequency being higher makes the whole sound, sound the whole thing you're pronouncing sound higher pitch. A side effect of this that you can see here is that since you only generate the integer multiples of that sound, the higher pitch you go, the less of these are present. So since you have a higher pitch here, you have less peaks in the signal. The lower pitch here, you, it becomes almost so diffused that it almost looks continuous. What's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that it's now more difficult to discern the envelope. It's more difficult to realize that this is the amplitude envelope over here because you have less data to work with than it is over here. And so the consequence of that is that if somebody speaks at a much higher pitch, let's say a opera singer, who go, might go very high pitch, when you're trying to hear and, and find out what they're saying, it might be really hard to understand them because you just don't get nearly as much signal to get out the envelope of where the power is in the frequency spectrum to get out what they are saying. All right, let's put this into an HMM. So each time slice now corresponds to some interval. Initially, it's continuous time, but we'll make it discrete time. Then we might have 10 millisecond time slices. For each time slice, we generate a model. If we are pronouncing a certain sound, uh, uh, and so forth, for each one of them, there's a distribution over what are the possible um, things we might see in the frequency spectrum. We build that from data to You'd look at a lot of data, and from that, empirically build a distribution of what's likely to be seen. OK, so now we know what's likely to be pronounced. We know our emission model, given a certain sound. But that's not enough. Remember, um, sounds can appear in, s in different ways. It's going to be noisy, right? So it's not going to be enough, just like in the website browsing, not enough to just have evidence locally. You need a sequence of evidence to then discern what word has been pronounced. So that's where the HMM comes in. So we need a transition model. Um, in each state for the HMM, there is something that says, oh, I'm in the middle of pronouncing ah, uh, a, and so forth. Um, and then there's a probability of continuing to pronounce that. And there's a probability to switch to pronouncing a new sound. All right, so 
uh, state space is known, and here's what the transition model could look like. So this is not an HMM what we're looking at here, right? This is the conditional distributions inside an HMM shown. Initially, you start in a start state. If you pronounce the word need, you start in a start state. Then you're in state N1, where you're saying the letter N. You might end up um, staying there, or you might end up transitioning to the next sound, which is E. Then there you again might decide to stay at any given time, or you might decide to transition to the next one. And again here, probability of staying, probability of transitioning. So the probability of staying in E will be built based on you look at a lot of data. How long does it typically get pronounced, the E in need? And then based on that, you say, well, if it's pronounced pretty long, then the probability of staying is pretty high. If it's a very short thing, pronunciation-wise, then you'd have a very high probability of moving on. Yes? You're right, so the model of saying, let's say, am I pronouncing this with some probability, I continue with some probability, I skip, to the next, skip forward to the next thing, that is just an approximation. If you use that kind of model, you get the distribution out over lengths of pronunciation. That's a very particular distribution, it's a geometric distribution. It's not necessarily the perfect match to if you look at the distribution that you actually have over lengths of pronunciation, but in practice, it's proven good enough. And the nice thing about it is that since it's good enough and it's simple, you can keep working with an HMM, it can be worked with efficiently. For some things, if you know this is always pronounced really long, then you might split it up explicitly into multiple stages. You might say need is always really long, and then you would introduce an extra state here. So you have to always at least two steps rather than sometimes just one. That's a way to force it to be longer. You have a little more control that way. Okay, then once you look at our transition model within a word, after the word finishes, you need to decide which word is going to be the next word. So that's also encoded in our HMM. It says now I'm transitioning to a new state, which is the start of a new word. How do you build that model? Well, you might just look at counts. If the word currently was the, you look online, how often, how often is the followed by first, by same, by following, and so forth, and then you check the counts, normalize, and you say that's the probability of going from the to first, and so forth. All right, so this is a way to include a language model in your speech recognition. Now we'll understand language statistics and understand that even though it's noisy what you hear, whether a word is likely or not likely to follow another word will help you in determining what was being said. All right. Um, Decoding works with the Viterbi algorithm. That's the algorithm we looked at today. The max version rather than the sum version. You want to find the most likely sequence of words given the pronunciation. Um, there's some tricks to be played because it's a large state space to handle that. But from a high level point of view, this is how it works to do speech recognition. Next time we'll look at base nets, which are a generalization of hidden Markov models. <laughs>